pioneer, a person or group that sees potential, originates, or helps open up a new line of thought, or activity, or method, or technical development. Let's meet a few pioneers in the field of no-tillage agriculture. In 1990, Howard Martin and his family discovered and began manufacturing Martin Row Cleaners in Elkton, Kentucky. I believe in UK. I believe in extension service. It's been a great blessing to me. And I'm proud of what they've done. I'm proud to say that I've got to witness some of this. I really, I've always kind of looked at the extension guys as kind of heroes. My father, uh, I guess it was unique for our neighborhood. He was like so many out that way. He didn't have much formal education, but he learned to read and he loved to read. And he used the uh, extension agent here in uh, Todd County to give him advice about fertility and soils and different things. And then about 1946, he was instrumental in helping uh, get the Soil Conservation Service started here in the county. And he was teachable. He loved, he would pass on to me things that he'd learned. I began to get a feeling that, you know, we had a something on the surface of the earth that was fragile, that was non-renewable, and it was expendable. And, uh, and I, even as a teenager, I began to worry when we'd have big storms and I'd see gullies and, and I would think about what Mr. Alcott, the conservationist, had taught my father. He encouraged my father and others in the community to do strip cropping. This happened to be, happens to be a photograph made in 1962, the year that Harry Young made his uh, famous first try at no-till planting. Harry Young is an innovative farmer in southwestern Kentucky. Harry, tell us about your operation. Well, I operate about 1,235 acres of land producing corn, small grain, and soybeans. I produce the soybeans double cropped behind the small grain, and that way I wind up with about 1,800 acres of grain crops on the 1,200 acres of land. Now, Harry, when did you start the uh, no-till? I started with no-till corn in 1962. In 1967, I planted my first no-till double crop soybeans. And since that time, I've been all the way with no-till. How many acres of no-till soybeans were planted here in Christian County this year? Uh, in excess of 40,000 acres of no-till soybeans. I grew up uh, with my grandfather farming and oh, in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, when we would have a ditch or a washout, we'd just fill it up take a break and plow, fill it up, and work, work over it. And as that progressed, I, I saw myself that, that was, there had to be a better way. And then uh, we probably got into conservation, probably started about 77, 78, and then uh, since, I'm gonna say the last 20 years, we've been completely no-till. It's helped not only on the soil erosion, but on our equipment. We don't have to have as much equipment as we typically, typically would have to have. Most of the time we can get into the field when we need to, or if we work the ground, the ground would be too wet and we couldn't get in there to work it. But uh, yeah, that's, there's no doubt that it's helped my farming operation, especially in the last 20 years. Conservation and using the uh, UK Extension Service has kind of been part of my upbringing and throughout my life, and I've relied on them. Dr. Murdoch has been very uh, kind and accommodating, and, and the double cropping and the wheat stubble took right off. I mean, it increased wheat acreage all over the Pinner Uh It actually created jobs because the uh, flour mills took notice of the amount of soft red winter wheat that was being planted in this area and because they saw it as a reliable source of uh, good quality soft red winter wheat. There's been a lot of soil saved. And the University of Kentucky is to be commended for taking a lead. But you know, you gotta always go back to the pioneer. Harry Young persisted even beyond maybe where he should have for his financial well-being because when he got into no-till corn with nothing but paraquat and atrazine, can you imagine when Johnson grass levels were increasing, constantly increasing year after year. We used to go from row to row, packing a bucket, digging it up, 
trying to kill it with atlasite and different soil sterilants, and knowing that if it ever broke through, we would practically be out of corn growing. We could maybe get some soybeans, you know, and kind of pull a crop off there, but we wouldn't get, we're not going to be able to grow corn in the midst of Johnson grass. And, but little by little, Johnson grass won the war. And so it had practically driven people into full, I mean, it just demanded full tillage, incorporated herbicides and all of that that, you know, creates so much erosion. And Mr. Young did not live to get to see the age of Roundup Ready. Roundup Ready made it possible for anybody to be a no-tiller. The major problem that uh, Mr. Young had was in the beginning as the pioneer was uh, did not have herbicides to use, no burn down materials, no chemicals to use other than maybe lasso uh, to use on, on his crop. And so he was constantly dealing with a weed and grass problem that he was trying to plant into, I'm sure. It's so easy now that I can't even congratulate a man for choosing to be a no-tiller because all he's doing is the smart and right thing, according to Howard Buffett. He said, how many times do you see the right thing and the smart thing lined up together? And he's talking about uh, no-till in particular. I went by Planters Hardware after the first field day and bought one eight-wave no-till coulter. And I took it home and I tried to uh, operate it by hand, tried to push it through the soil just to see what, what that magic was all about, you know, that big wave at work. But those things turned out to be uh, a real nuisance. As we went further into no-till, no-till cultures actually become a negative because of the way that they would uh, pull the soil up if it was a little bit clay, moist, or plastic, cheesy, whatever, and toss it away from where it was needed. The original mounting for the no-till coulter came off of a plow because, you know, the old plows had a cutter in front. Okay, so we tried a, a fluted-type coulter. It did not, it threw out too much dirt. Then we tried a single cutter. Well, it didn't put enough to f cover the seed, right? So we went to what we called a bubble coulter. It had bubbles like steel on the side. It would open enough and not have to uh, rake the dirt or the soil back over it. So that's what we ended up with. I think about Mr. Young out there risking betting the farm, literally. And you got you got to admire that. I mean, that. I think all pioneers suffer some. Uh, after they clear the way, then you've got a path to follow, and it's a lot easier. The acceptance is, you know, that barrier's kind of been overcome, and it doesn't take much to be a follower. Even in double crop wheat stubble, it was only certain hours of the day that the no-till culture would cut through the residue. And generally about two or three days after harvest, it would begin to be dry enough, the bottom part, part of the stubble, you know, the crown and all, that you could cut through. So you were very limited and uh, it, it was just kind of a happenstance, hit or miss thing. It helped if you had uh, firmer type soil underneath for the culture to operate against if the straw was mature. That is not the issue that I was thinking about when I come up with the little rake wheel, road cleaner idea. I was thinking about corn, no-tilled on wetter type soils. And I'd read a piece out of Crops and Soils magazine from Iowa State University research saying that removing the residue, just an eight inch man, would increase the soil temperature six or eight degrees. So then that become my goal was just to move some residue back. And soil specialist Lloyd Murdoch of the University of Kentucky College of Agriculture says a device previously used for no-till corn can also help improve stands in soybeans. 
This has been around about four, four years, maybe five years, and it was invented by Howard Martin here in Kentucky, and it's uh, being adapted nationwide. Uh, it's two wheels that are kind of intermeshed, and they push the straw, the residue to the side, and you set them so that you just barely have the teeth in the ground so that you're just pushing the residue to the side, and it pushes this uh, combine heavy straw to the side. You're gonna have to cut through a little straw with your double scope. Basically, it uh, leaves it pretty clean. So we're out there in the shop, and Stephen immediately takes to this. He likes this stuff. And I'm thinking, well, maybe we can, you know. Phone's ringing. We had allowed uh, Prairie Farmer to do a uh, news article, and it was on the front page of Kentucky. Indiana or Ohio Prairie Farmer picked up the story, and people were calling from Ohio, and and we're out there in the old farm shop trying to put together a few hundred of these things and the phones ringing and ringing. And I like to think that you know, it was a whole combination of things, but if you want to get right down to it, I know uh, a lot of people credit Solomon with being one of the wisest men of all times, and he said that uh, luck. Now, I didn't initially start no-tilling with the understanding that it's been gained by researchers since then about soil health, microbes, air and water exchange, and how it's improved with earthworms, uh, channels, and so forth. Dad started the cattle farm here, what this was, with all the barns and so forth, and, and cropping, and that's how we got into no-till, or he got into no-till. I was just a little guy, but I can remember him sitting at the supper table talking about it, and he said, the best thing about no-till is your dirt's gonna stay where it is and it's not going down the creek. This farm we're on here is 100% no-till. Even though we're raising some hemp and cultivating hemp, we're not doing it on this farm. We're doing it on some of the other farms that we have rented because some of them have already been in cultivation uh, practices and to get to a full no-till cover crop, there's a three or four year lag time in there to, to get all the microorganisms and everything kind of looking in your direction, more or less, and get all the earthworms going. I don't remember the uh, corn and soybean ground ever being plowed. Now, I remember plowing tobacco, and we kept tobacco in the conventional system for until 2002 or three or four. And so I spent a lot of time as a child uh, cultivating tobacco and side dressing, driving up and down the fields on a, on a little Super A tractor. And, but no, it's been no-till on most of the ground for, for my lifetime. Well, Dr. Murdoch's uh, research on uh, surface applied P and K and the fact that stratification of P and K in the surface layer is not a problem for no-till crops. And he explained to me about uh, the water and uh, the fact that uh, some of those nutrients would be moved down via the earthworms castings and what the work that the earthworms do. But the very fact that he pointed out most of the plant's roots are in the surface a couple of inches. And since you have residue holding moisture at the surface a lot longer, of course, than you do in conventional till, that moisture combined with that high level of nutrients from surface applied P and K actually gives you an opportunity to think of it as a band. It's like, he called it a surface band. You know, banding is more efficient. We know that. We've talked about P and K for years and how that putting it in a band beside the row is more efficient than broadcasting it and mixing it in the soil. Well, in this case, we're doing neither. We're putting it on the surface. We're not, brought, we're not mixing it in with a huge volume of soil, so we have access to it because the residue is holding the moisture at the surface where the nutrients are and where uh, the main feeder roots are. If you go out there this morning, you see water standing everywhere. If you look to the north side of Hopkins, the north side of Russellville, the north side of Elkton, you see the same thing. It's perched, it's completely filled all the way to here. And consequently, every additional drop that falls today will run off and it'll carry something with it. Anything that's loose, soil, residue, whatever, rocks. Not so over here with the karst type or limestone-based soils. They have more clay, it holds them together better, 
and have a lot better water infiltration. The sinkholes are being filled today. It's going down, it's traveling on the ground. You can go back out there tomorrow and you can walk on those fields. You go out here, if it was tilled, you won't be able to walk on it until the middle of April. So, yeah, two different soils type. There's a distinct line. It runs along either side of Highway 68. Same way in, uh, in the Princeton, Kentucky area. That's what made that an ideal place to do research. You had both types of soil at one research center, two of the predominant types, one highly productive, another one with, with problems, uh, marginal type soil. The basic concept for this little factory is a U with raw material coming in. You have your area where the, uh, what we call the dirty area where the flames, the welders and the cutting table operate. And you come into a cleaner area where the, the high precision machine are and then over into cleaning and painting and around to shipping. Let me say this for uh, recognition of what Stephen's done. You may have to uh, cut my salary a little bit for, if I tell you this part. There is not a machine out there that I can turn on. I can turn the lights on, but I can't turn any of those machines on. I don't know how. I say it came to me. The Bible says all good things come from above. There's nothing that I have that I didn't receive. And if I did receive it, how can I brag about it? So I didn't come up with nothing. Inventions by statute, the way that patent office reads, are called discoveries. You know why they're called discoveries? It was already here. The metal was here, it just hadn't been bent in this particular way. But I guess I was primarily thinking about Champaign County, Illinois, and a few of those places. There are not that many of them, when you get right down to it, that are just you know, you see six miles into the next township and it's black and it's tiled and the county furnishes you a main to heat your tile to and, and uh, water goes down good. As long as the water goes down and the wind don't blow, the soil's gonna stay where it is. But either wind or rain can move it. I'm here at the Martin Home Place visiting with Howard Martin, and he's a good example of uh, adversity sometimes that brings out the best in people. And Howard uh, farmed these old hillsides of Kentucky and with the Fragipan soils, and they're so wet. And he believed no-till was the way, but these soils aren't adapted to no-till. And he came up with the idea and the hard work and faced the adversity of inventing the row cleaners that uh, made no-till adapted to these types of soils and to a lot of soils in the, in the United States. This invention uh, changed no-till in a lot of ways. One of the most important and highly adapted uh, inventions of no-tillage in the last many years. And uh, when he did this, uh, no-till began to take off on these types of soils, many other soils in the United States. And uh, so it became the main way to farm difficult no-till soils. And it has changed no-tillage in, in the United States and in many places in the world. Mm -hmm.